Well, it's a privilege to be with you all, all the way from North Carolina. I have left behind, momentarily, my wife and four young kids, but it's a true privilege to be with you. I've known Ben, really appreciated the things that he and his family have been doing ministry-wise, and I've actually been kind of surprised to know that I've known some of you in the past as well. And so I'm really, really thankful for the opportunity to spend this morning with you, especially with uh, such exciting announcements, such as we heard this morning that God has provided a building to meet in, and that is something that we can rejoice together that the Lord has provided. Today what we're going to do is we're going to explore Psalm 115. So if you have your Bibles, please turn there. And to kind of introduce Psalm 115, I think it's, it's appropriate to even mention what we have experienced our entire lives to a degree, and that's that we live in a broken world, don't we? I mean, you and I can empathize with what Habakkuk himself has said at the very beginning of his prophecy in Habakkuk 1. He says, destruction and violence are before me. Destruction and violence are before us, aren't they? He also says, strife and contention arise. He says, the law is paralyzed. Justice never goes forward. The wicked surround the righteous, and justice goes forward perverted. I mean, feels like Habakkuk is prophesying about our day, doesn't it? See, we understand that we live in a broken society. We live in a time when... The wicked often triumph. The righteous are often punished for being righteous. But it's not just that society is broken. It's not just that we suffer on a grand scale. We also suffer individually as well. If we went around the room, I'm sure we would have tales of, of lost family members, sicknesses, losses of jobs. The list goes on and on. We suffer both on a societal level, seeing wickedness all around us, but then we also experience evil, calamity, disaster on a personal level. We all do. And if you find yourself in that brief window of time right now where you're saying, you know, things are really good. I I can't even think of anything bad that's going on in my life. Be prepared. It's coming, right? That's the way of the world. That's the way of the world. We live in a fallen world. And Psalm 115 helps us process that. Psalm 115 helps us understand exactly how we're supposed to process trouble. Now, if you look at verse 2 of Psalm 115, you know, what are we doing? Jumping into verse 2, not verse 1. We'll backtrack in just a second. But if you look at verse 2, notice the context here where the psalmist says, Why should the nations say, Where is their God? And if you look at how that phrase is used in Scripture, uh, Psalm 42 is another one where that's used. And in Psalm 42, verse 3, the psalmist says, My tears have been my food day and night, while they say to me all day, Where is your God? See, this phrase is used to communicate the, the mocking idea that you're in trouble and your God can't help you. And so we understand then that Psalm 115 is talking about a situation where the nations are looking at the people of God and saying, you're in trouble. Where's your God now? Where's your God at this time? And so the question is, where is our God? The question is, how should we think about it when we go through difficulty, when, when that trial comes upon us, when, when that calamity seems to be unbearable, how should we think? Should we call out for help? Well, as the Psalms teach us, that would be a natural reaction, and one would think that that would almost be unqualifiably correct, but there's a right way to do that. And so Psalm 115 gives us that right way. So as we look through this, Psalm 115 is going to give us four insights into how God's people should think and act in the midst of difficulty, okay? So four insights, and the first one, starting off in verse 1 and including verse 2, is God's people long for God to be glorified in this world. 
Now, look at what it says in verse 1. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Now, stop right there for just a moment. What we see here, God's people long for God to be glorified. Now, what we see is that the primary motivating desire of the psalmist He's in difficulty, right? He's in difficulty along with his fellow compatriots, but he doesn't say, do it for me, God. So what we need to understand, and this is so rich, we could just camp on this all morning. But what we need to understand is that the primary motivating factor, the motivating desire for the believer when we're asking for God to intercede on our behalf is not for our benefit, but it's for God's glory. That is so crucial, so crucial. Now, I'm sure if you've been in church any amount of time, you're familiar with the fact that we exist for God's glory. It's not as if God was lonely and created us and said, hey, you know what, it'd be cool to make some human beings, so let's do that, and, you know, I want to serve that. No, that's not how God operates. God is organizing and orchestrating all of creation to testify of his magnificence, of his grandeur, of his glory. You know, you look, you look at the, I, I, I'm from North Carolina, and so it's super flat where I'm from. We do have mountains in the west, but I'm in Raleigh, which is in the middle of, like, flatness. So I land, and I look around, and I'm thinking, look at these magnificent hills. These are awesome. So I know you're, you're just used to it. You don't care. But for me, I was thinking, wow, what a testament of God's glory. This is really awesome. And that's what God does is he puts the stars in the sky. He m- paints the landscapes. He creates you and I. And he does all that to give himself glory, to show how great and, and uh, creative he is. And you think about that. That that idea where God's greatness and glory is the primary reason God even exists and and does things, that ought to filter down to how we process our difficulties. Now, that can be difficult to comprehend, so let's walk through it just a little bit. I I think to think about it like this, it's it's a bad thing to suffer, okay? Now, there is a good, there's a goodness to suffering, Okay, we know that, you know, even as James says, consider it joy when you fall into trials for it produces godly character. That's James 1, 2 through 4. We know that that's true. And so there is a goodness that comes from suffering. But you know that God, when God created the world in Genesis 1 and 2, he did not create the world to suffer. That's an effect of the fall. Right? And there will be a time in the future where he alleviates all suffering. He alleviates all sickness. So he didn't create the world to suffer, but we do suffer because of sin. And so at a very basic level, it's not good to suffer, if if that makes sense. So hopefully you understand what I'm driving at is that there's a benefit in our character and in our relationship with God to suffer, but the way God's designed the world is that there would not be suffering, okay? But it's because of sin where that happens. Now, In and of itself, that means that it is actually a good thing to call out to God for relief, okay? So when you see something bad that's happening, when you see injustice, when you see suffering, it is good to call out to God to fix that. And you read through the Psalms, you can't can't come away with any other viewpoint than that, right? That's exactly what the psalmist does over and over and over again. He says, how long will you allow this to happen, Lord? Intercede, act. But here's the thing. Did you know that it's actually, even asking for a good thing can be done out of wrong motivations? And that's really what we're zeroing in on here, is that it's a good thing to ask God to intercede. To, it's a good thing to ask God to, to help those that are suffering. It's a good thing to ask God to bring us out of difficulty. Those are all good requests, but they can be made out of hearts that are bent on the wrong motives. Uh, A classic illustration of this, one of my favorites, would be 1 Samuel 8, where Israel asks God for a king. Now, uh, this is a debated issue, but I'll just tell you what's right and you believe me, okay? So, uh, Israel was always intended to have a king. Deuteronomy 17 has the law of the king. 
Uh, in prophesying to Abraham, God promised Abraham that a king would come from him. So Israel was always supposed to have a king. It wasn't the desire for a king that was wrong in Israel. It was the context and motive of that desire. They wanted to have a king like the other nations to protect them and to give them security, even though God himself was supposed to be their security. So they asked for a king. So the request itself in the right context would have been fine. With the right motivation, it would have been fine. But they asked out of the wrong motive. And you know what the scariest part of that illustration is? God gave them a king. Just remember that whenever you're asking God for something, I think about this a lot now because I ask God for something and then there's a little voice in the back of my head that says, be careful, God might give you what you're asking for. You're like, oh, wait. Maybe, maybe I shouldn't ask. For and that's why it's so important. And this, this is exactly why we say, if this is your will, right? That's what this verse is encapsulating is it's not for us. It's not to us that we desire the glory or we desire the benefit. It's to your name we desire the glory. And so you look at what the psalmist is doing here. He's starting on a very, very strong foundation. This, this applies to all requests, but in the immediate context, he's talking about in the midst of difficulty— The primary motivating factor for the believer needs to be that we want God to be glorified. And so he asks, not to us, O Lord, but to your name, give the glory. Now that next phrase, the second part of verse 1, for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Now, these are very crucial terms that show up throughout the Old Testament as part of the main descriptions of God's character. And so what the psalmist is doing, he's saying, on, on, the, on behalf of who you are, in your, the, the translation, you could have different, different ideas. It's steadfast love. It could be sometimes translated kindness or loyal love is one of my favorite translations of it. So the idea is that your loyal and faithful covenant love, on behalf of that, because of who you are, because of the promises you've made in accordance with your relationship, be true to those promises. And remember, now, we'll get a little bit of ahead of ourselves here, but, well, I promised myself as I was thinking through this that I have to, I have to do a better job of showing you how important this is. So keep your finger here, but go to Exodus 34, Okay. Um, we're going to go on a little excursus here. Sometimes, just for sake of time, I, I'll just reference passages. But then I've been convicted of that recently because we need to set our eyes on it. You have much better retention when we set our eyes on the text of Scripture. And so turning to Exodus 34 is so important here. This is the great revelation of God's character. It's his self-revelation. This is where God himself reveals what kind of God he is, who he actually is. And... This is a tidbit. This is, can I have like a seminary classroom moment for a second? Okay, I'm going to teach you something that has nothing to do with what we're talking about for a second. Um, This is the most quoted passage in the Old Testament. So a lot of times we don't, we think of how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, but this passage in Exodus 34 is the most cited and quoted passage in the entire Old Testament, meaning that Old Testament prophets, Old Testament Uh, characters, they all are referring to this. Even in, I would argue, Psalm 115, uh, the the psalmist is thinking of this passage by using the term steadfast love and faithfulness because they they occur side by side in this text. Okay, seminary time over. Moving to verse 6 of Exodus 34. The Lord passed before him, that's Moses, and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord, this is God speaking, right? So the Lord, Yahweh, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what we just saw, right? And keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting iniquity of the fathers of the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. So notice what we see here is the very first thing God wants us to understand about himself when he's telling us about him is that he is a God who is merciful. He is a God who is gracious. He is slow to anger. He's abounding in steadfast love. That's that same word, that covenantal love and faithfulness. It's very difficult to translate that word 
I was reading some more commentaries on it recently where they said, you know, really you need a phrase to encapsulate it because it's talking about a, a covenantal loyal love which is present that God has for his people on the basis of his promises that he has given to them. That is the love that God has. And, and that's the front load of who he wants us to remember him as. And then he's, he also includes, just in case you were thinking, okay, so no one's going to pay for their sins or anything like that. No, he also is a God of justice. And so those who sin will be punished, to be sure. But he longs to forgive. He longs to be gracious and compassionate. So if you think of that, that text, uh, obviously we're in Psalm 115, but if you were to go to Psalm 103, you would see the same thing. That text is referenced there, which you know that psalm. It's, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, uh, bless his holy name. And it talks about how great God is and, and how good he has been to his people. And then in the middle of that psalm, he says, for the Lord is gracious and compassionate and slow to anger. Same thing in Psalm 145. Same thing in Nehemiah 9, when Nehemiah is reflecting on the sins of his people, and he says, let's turn to the Lord because he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Uh, maybe another one that you would know is, is Jonah, in, in the story of Jonah. Uh, Jonah 4 is rather kind of, I don't know. I, I always teach through Jonah for, as part of the curriculum in seminary, and and it's always mind-boggling to me every single time because Jonah is basically the anti-type of a missionary. You know, it's just like, okay, we should study Jonah in what not to do in missions. You know, it's just like, Jonah, go to the Ninevites. Right. To Tarshish I go. You know, it's just like, ah, uh, okay. But what's interesting in Jonah 4 is Jonah gets into like an arguing match with God. Again, not a great thing you want to do if you want to live. But Jonah starts arguing with God, and the people of Nineveh repent. And by the way, Jonah wasn't really interested in that. But the people repented anyway, despite Jonah's lack of effort. And so Jonah gets upset at their repentance. And he said, I knew this was going to happen. She's like, what? <laughs> Is that why you didn't want to go? Because you thought they would repent? Yes. And then he, guess what, well, guess what verse he quotes? He quotes Exodus 34 to God. He says, I knew you were a God gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. I knew that. That's why I didn't want to be a missionary. It's like, what? It's like, you want to grab Jonah by the lapels and say, come on, man, get a grip. But you realize that he had such good theology that it actually drove him to do the wrong thing. He actually knew what God had revealed about himself, that he was gracious, that he was compassionate, and so he said, listen, if I go there, God is a God of mercy and God is a God of gracious love and he loves to pour out his grace on people and I just bet you the Ninevites would receive that. I don't want to be a part of that. So now notice in Psalm 115, this is what he utilizes as the, as the foundation of, of this. He says, not to us give glory, but to your name and on account of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. In other words, because of who you are, do this. Not because of, and really the, the key point here, which maybe you've experienced this as well. Do you ever find yourself praying to God and you're kind of stuck with how to pray? And you can't really say, Lord, because I'm awesome and I'm so great, please do this for me. You can't say that. Nobody can. But what you can say is because of who you are, because of what you've done, because of your character, do this for the sake of your glory. And the psalmist knows that. But then that's why the nations, that, that's why there, there's a disconnect here. Because in verse 2, the nations say, why, where is God? And that, that's what, why the psalmist is crying out about this. is because there's a huge disconnect. And, and anybody who loves the Lord hates this. Where somebody can mock God and say, where is your God? What is your God doing? God's doing nothing. And the deep desire of, of us as believers, those who, who love the Lord, we, we don't want God to be defamed. We want his character to be on display. We, we don't want people to question God's goodness. We don't want people to question his covenantal faithfulness, right? This is what drives us. It ought to drive us. And so why should the nations say these things. And so then that brings us, ultimately, well, and, and think about, it before we move on to verse 3, which is really the answer to verse 2, think about, if you're having trouble understanding exactly what, what's going on in verse 2, think about the idea of 
a parent, for example, and how they, how they interact with their, with their children, okay? Like, if, if we were to find, and we've seen news stories about this, if we were to find out that, that a parents had children and they had just neglected their, their duty as parents to, to feed them, to provide for them, you know, it's, it's always atrocious when you hear the news stories of the kids who have been, been found and they haven't had their diapers changed in 32 days and all those different things. And it's appalling to us because there's an expected role that we, we no, inherently, parents are supposed to be relating to their children. They are supposed to be providing for them, taking care of them. And that's the same thing that's going on is when, when somebody claims to be under the care of God, under Yahweh, and the world around looks and says, where's your God? Where's your God? It doesn't look like you're taken care of. That's what should bother us. Not the fact, and, and by the way, I'm not saying that we're all superhuman or anything like that, but it, it ought to be that desire for God's reputation that drives us more so than just, oh, this is uncomfortable for me, or oh, this is painful for me. I'm not demeaning that. I know trials are difficult, but the, you, can, you can measure your maturity, as it, as it were. You can measure your maturity by how well you encapsulate this attitude in your heart, where you deeply desire more than anything the glory of of God and to see his reputation further. That is so important. And so the answer to verse 2 is verse 3 then. So that brings us to the second main point. The second point, not just that God's people long for God to be glorified in this world, but that God's people understand that the Lord is sovereign and powerful and really any alternative to God is completely ridiculous. Any alternative is foolish, and it's also corrupting. We'll look at that in just a second. But notice uh, in verse 3 how the translation uh, fits with this. And depending on what translation you have, the ESV just goes right into it and it says, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. But if you're reading something like the LSB or the NASB uh, or the New King James, King James, they're going to have a basically a conversive conjunction there with but. Okay? And... It, it shows that there's a direct connection between verses 2 and 3. Uh, it's almost as if the, the question is left, where is their God? And then the answer in the next one is, but our God is in heaven. In other words, this is the answer to their question. Is they're asking, what is your God up to? Where is he? Why isn't he here? And our answer, the answer of God's people is understanding God's sovereign and powerful status. He's in heaven. You know, I'm reminded even uh, of Ecclesiastes 5, where uh, in the wise sage, as he's processing things, he, he talks about how our God is in heaven, therefore let your words be few. In other words, he processes, the sage does in Ecclesiastes, that God in his heavenly throne, he sees beyond the little you know, hills and valleys that we're limited by. He, under, he understands in a total perspective how life is working, what it's working toward, what it is that he's doing. And, and that's so hard for us. Many times we look in, in the darkness, in the difficulty, we look and we are blocked. We can't see around the corner. We can't see. It doesn't matter how powerful our flashlight is. Uh, actually, I'm sure there are some caves around here. Aren't there some caves in Idaho somewhere? Yeah, I see some nods, okay? There are some caves like way west of us uh, in North Carolina, but we don't have any near us. But I always have enjoyed going into a cave just because it makes you feel so small. It makes you feel so helpless. You know, it's one of my favorite things to, to just, you know, go in there with the light and then everyone turn off their lights. And that somebody always spoils it with their glow-in-the-dark shoes. It's terrible. <laughs> Hate it. But ideally, there's just complete and utter darkness. It's so black, you just can't see through it. And no matter what kind of flashlight you have, if you go into the really darkest, you know, recess of, of the earth... You know, it's just, you can't have a flashlight bright enough, right? It's just, you can't, you can't see long enough down into, down into the depths of the earth and all that. And that, that's just the reality of it. it was we are limited in our human capacity. But God sees. God is in heaven. God is in heaven. And that's the whole point, is that he's not limited to earth. And this is going to be a big contrast to the following verses where the idols are the ones who are limited, 
drastically so. But our God is not limited to creation. He's the one who created. He's not limited. He sees, and he does what he pleases. Now, here's the thing. On the one hand, you could take this the right or wrong way, really, uh, but you must take it the right way. On the one hand, you could just take this as, okay, I guess nobody can stand up to God. I guess God just does whatever he wants, and, and we're just all along for the ride. Well, in one sense, that is the very .001% of the truth. But the, the deeper reality is that God, in his character, which that's why we made a big point of revealing that character, in what he does, in what he pleases, he acts in accordance with his character, which is, guess what, his merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. That is who he is. And so when he acts in accordance with what he pleases, he is not a whimsical deity that some of the ancients used to worship where they would offer their children to try to get it to rain on the ground. And then they would offer their their oxen to try to promote uh, fertility in the land. No, that's not God. God does what he wishes, but in accordance with his goodness and with his kindness. Now, again, I'm I'm not saying God won't judge sin. Please don't misunderstand me. But we're talking in the context here of believers, those of us who have put our faith and trust in Christ Jesus. God wants our good. He wants to benefit us. And so when it says he does all that he pleases, it's talking about his power and his authority, absolutely. But we read that in the context of verse 1, for the sake of his steadfast love and his faithfulness. And let me just tell you something. That is... In my mind, one of the most encouraging realities out there. I think, uh, I, I remember in particular going through a, a rather difficult trial. Looking back, it's, it's funny, you always grow through your trials. And so I look back and I say, what a weakling. But when I was going through it, I thought, man, this is probably one of the greatest trials that anyone's ever gone through, you know, of course. And, uh, and I just remember being so young. I was in college. And uh, I, I just remember being so young and not having much of an experience with with those tri- with trials and, and having to trust God. And I just remember, I just remember going through that difficulty and, and really struggling with this idea that, okay, if, if God is in control, if God is in control, I mean, Scripture seems to be very clear about that. He is sovereign. He is in control. Would he even care about me? Like, he's so great and so awesome and so mighty. How, how could he even care about little old me? I mean, I'm just a speck on the you know, universe scale. You know, you just brush it off or whatever. It doesn't really matter. But then that's where the, the beauty of God's love comes to play. His character complements his sovereignty. And so I just remember really coming to grips with that and that taking such a load off of my shoulders, understanding that it wasn't needless suffering. It wasn't, it wasn't uh, you know, just God laughing, saying, ha, watch what I can make him suffer or things like that. I knew two things to be true. God was in control. He was powerful enough. He was sovereign enough. He was in absolute control. And he also loved me. You know, if you want more on that, I have no qualms about recommending uh, the, the book by Jerry Bridges, Trusting God. Like, love that book. I think I've read it three or four times. It's just such a great book talking about how those two ideas just really meld together, and how God is in complete control. Scripture is, is absolutely clear on that, but he also loves us, so we know that his power isn't, isn't just there to oppress us or anything like that, but he's actually concerned for us. He loves us. The things he does have a purpose and a meaning. And so it's actually interesting because, you know, when you, when you go through this, like this trial that I went through in college, I remember, I remember asking my, my dad even because I didn't have much experience. I, I remember asking him and say like, dad, tell me, tell me some examples of how God has shown you love in his control. Show me how he has been faithful to you through, throughout your life. And that was, that was so, so good for me to hear examples of that and then understand that I needed to wrestle with this reality, grapple with this point, and understand that God is in heaven, he's in control, and he loves me. He do, he's able to do whatever he wants, but 
all that that includes is for my good. You know, it's the Romans, Romans 8 principle there. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. But notice the key contrast here. The, the rest of this point is that in strong contrast to God, who is completely strong, completely sovereign, completely authoritative, idols are completely worthless. Now look at this, verse 4 and following. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but they do not speak. They have eyes, but they do not hear. They have ears, but they do not hear. They have noses, but they do not smell. They have hands, but do not feel. Feet, but do not walk. And they do not make a sound in their throat. Now, this is, again, uh, in a context where there, there was no such thing as an atheist in, in the ancient world, everyone had their gods, you know, the gods of Dagon, or if you fast forward into uh, the time of Christ, you had the, the Zeus and the Apollo and the Athena and uh, Artemis and all these, these gods of various capacities, and they would have their idols and the images, and they would worship these gods. And of course, the complete irony is in contrast to God who is in heaven, and, and by the way, you know this is is well as anybody, but it's good to be reminded of these things, is that God actually forbade making an image of him, right? Which is the reason he does that, by the way, just in case you're curious, is that uh, he wants there to be a separation between him and creation. He wants people to understand that you can't bring creation up to his level and you can't bring him down to creation's level. There is a distinction there. And so that's why there's a prohibition against making an image of uh, making an image of the one true heavenly God. But in contrast to that, think about the complete lunacy of somebody who would, who would make an idol. They go down, they chop down a tree, they burn half of it to get warm. This is Isaiah 44, talks about this. In Isaiah 44, he says, you throw, you throw half of the wood into the fire to warm up, and then you bow down to half of it to worship. That is ridiculous. Who would ever do something like that? But, okay, so none of you are probably bowing down to idols right now, although in places in the world that is an issue still, right? But let's contextualize it a little bit in, in, our, in our day, okay? Some of you, myself as well, play act at this, and sometimes we will chop down a tree, we'll make paper, We'll make paper airplanes out of that paper, throw it around, but with the other half of paper, we will put our trust and security in it. It's called dinero, money. You know, we, we, say, we say, hey, you know what? With this money, I finally have security. I finally have peace. Now, as long as I put my trust and confidence in this, as long as I have enough of that, then I will be set for life, right? And that, that is in reality, no different than what they were doing in the ancient world, is they were saying, as long as I bow down to you, as long as I put my trust in you and my confidence in you, this God will take care of me. I, mean, I must give them a little bit here, a little bit there. And same thing, our pursuit of money, our pursuit of wealth, all of that can, can idolize, can pervert our focus from Yahweh. So there is, a, there is an element here where we laugh and we mock in, in a certain degree saying, nobody would be so stupid to think that an idol has power over individuals. But the reality is that we do fall prey to the modern idols, and it does detract us. The gods of materialism, the god of fame, the god of money, the god of relationships, all of those idols detract us from the one and true living God. By the way, another interesting side note about how the Old Testament talks about idolatry. One of the favorite ways that the, the prophets and the psalmist will talk about idols is they will use pejorative terms, so they won't just call them idols. And this is one, one area where our English translations a lot of times want us to, to understand that they're talking about idols, so we'll translate it as idols. But a lot of times they will just use filler terms like vain things, empty things, worthless things. In fact, one of my favorite phrases is in Jonah 2 where Jonah realizes that going against God's not a great idea. He's in the fish when he realizes that. And so he, he launches this massive prayer where he's quoting the Psalms left and right. And he, he says, uh, those who put their trust in, your translation probably says vain idols, 
But what he actually says is those who put their trust in vanities of emptiness, may they be cut off. May, they, may that be uh, deemed worthless. He, he just calls idols vanities of emptiness. And that's, that's really what we need to understand is that idols are, are not just to be viewed as things that are inanimate objects, but they are vain things, the pursuit of life, uh, vain emptiness ideas there. And notice what happens. This is, this is something we really need to key in on here. In verse 8, and, and really, this is what draws me back to this psalm time and time again, so permit me a little bit of time to just talk about this. In verse 8, the psalmist says, those who make them become like them. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. All right, so what he's talking about here, uh, one, of, one, of, uh, one of the scholars that has been influential in this realm talking about uh, idolatry in the Bible, his name's G.K. Beale. He's written a lot of really good stuff. He, he calls this the, the principle that those who worship idols become like idols. Or he said, to put it another way, we, we become like what we revere. Okay, so whatever we revere, whether it's God, whether it's idols, both uh, ancient or modern, we start to become like what we worship. Okay, and so notice what he's implying here on every single level is that those people who are worshiping these, these, these deaf and dumb and blind idols, what do they become? Deaf and dumb and blind. By the way, this is probably why, this is probably part of the background behind when um, Jesus, you know, is talking to the crowds and he says things like, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. It's probably applying to this principle where if you have the ability to hear, if you have not given over your heart to false gods, if you have not, if you have not deviated or detracted from the true God, then listen to what I'm saying. But the reality is, this is what the psalmist is saying here, and this is what we need to be very aware of, is that people who worship false gods or who put their trust in false gods, right? That's what it says too. It says, so do all who trust in them. So it's not just, he's not just saying if you're bowing down before some shrine, but if you're actually putting your trust in something, remember the idea of money or fame or fortune, you, you think of anybody who puts their trust in these realities slowly deadens to the things of God. That includes conscience, to be sure, but it includes your receptivity to the word. It includes your ability to respond to God calling to you. Idolatry kills, not the death of fast, lightning-quick obliteration, but the slow death of the disease-infected heart, which spreads then through the whole being. And so we need to be very careful about this. We've seen illustrations like, we, we can see illustrations in, in a very modern sense, you know, when we have you know, celebrity culture, for example, people look at the celebrities, they dress like celebrities, they want to be like the celebrities, and surprise, surprise, they start to think like the celebrities, which, if you understand what I'm going toward, that means they stop thinking, okay? It, that's the point, is once you start emulating something else, you stop thinking. There, there's a deadening that takes place there. And same thing with, with regard to when, when you watch a movie, for example. A movie could be a good illustration of that. People who are always inundating themselves with, with a movie and they're watching it, they're appreciating it, they're, they're loving it, they're revering it, they start to become like what they're watching. Now think about this from, from a personal perspective. Everyone wants to talk about these days about the need for self-love, okay? Let me be the first to say that I am going to start a organization about self-hate, all right? <laughs> So join with me. We're going to launch the self-hate club. No, what, what I'm talking about, though, is that there should be a self-denial. That's what the Bible talks about. But this whole thing about self-love, that's really coming from a totally anti-God worldview. In reality, the more you love yourself, the more you are pursuing your own desires and pursuing your own idolatrous wishes, you start to become like yourself. And, and if you start, I mean, anybody knows, 
if you, if you have a replicating process, like even if you were going to take a photo, nobody uses photocopies anymore. Like if you were just going to take a picture of a picture of a picture of a picture, eventually it just becomes so distorted that it's worthless, right? And it may take a while, sure, but that's the slow creep of corruption. And that's the reality is that whether it be the idolatry of self, whether it be the idolatry of fame and fortune, the celebrity cult, all those things are the siren call to all of us to pursue. But the reality is that when we pursue those things rather than God, it has a deadening effect upon us. Now, you know that as well as I do. This, does, this doesn't just apply to non-believers. How many of you have gone through a season of sin in your life or a season of idolatry where you don't really feel like praying? You don't really feel like reading your Bible? I was just talking recently to a young gentleman who, who was struggling with pornography, and I was just asking him, when was the last time you read your Bible? He said, well, it's been months. I just don't feel like it. I was like, well, when was the last time you prayed? He's like, well, I pray before bed every day. And he's like, well, what kind of prayers are those? Help me sleep, Lord, amen. You know, it's just, well, what kind of relationship? And he's like, yeah, I just, I just don't feel anything. And so we worked together uh, and praise the Lord through his grace. This, this young man has built up an established uh, accumulation of months now where he hasn't fallen into pornography. And the other day he texted me saying, I feel like the fog is gone. I want to read God's word. I want to pray. We, we understand that that's how life works. We need to rid ourselves of the idols. It's not just enough to say, I want Jesus or I want God. You also need to fight against the call of this world. And I would just go ahead and say, even with regard to uh, with regard to the very gospel itself, okay, we, we, when we give the gospel, we, we say, come to Jesus, all who are heavy laden. He promises to give you rest. Put your faith in him alone for salvation. There is salvation in no other name other than Christ in which man may be saved. All that is absolutely correct. But Jesus nowhere in the New Testament, do his followers never say, you just need to believe in Jesus and keep your life of sin. That is fine. He calls them to repent. He calls them to give up their idols. He calls them to give up their sins. And I would just really admonish you, whether you're you know, considering becoming a Christian or whether you are a Christian and you are in a season of sin or a life of sin, repent. You must, or it is killing you. Those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. Worship of God breeds life. Worship of anything else breeds death. He goes on, and this gives us our third point. God's people call for complete trust in God because he alone can offer help and protection from the difficulties of, of life. And notice what he says. Oh, Israel, trust in the Lord, for he is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. And you're saying, it seems like he's saying the same thing. He is, very astute of you, he is saying the same thing to emphasize the reality that it's God alone who is the help and the protection. Shield there is basically a in fancy terminology, we could call it like a synecdoche. You're like, what in the world does that mean? Well, what it means is that it's one item standing in place of a whole concept. So the shield is protection. God alone is the protection for his people. And so all who trust in God must put their faith in, in the Lord, and he is the help. He is the salvation. And so and notice what, what, is, what is being done here is that this is a call for the congregation to do this. So based on everything we've been talking about, who God is in contrast to the vain idols, the vanities of emptiness, who God is in regard to his covenant love, his faithfulness, the only conclusion then would be for us to put our complete trust in him, right? In the midst of difficulty, who can you trust in? Yahweh. In the midst of the trials of life, who can you put your utter dependence in? God, the creator of heaven and earth. 
And so God's people call for this complete trust in God because he alone offers help and protection from the difficulties of life. By the way, I, I did mention how in my life when I went through, when I went through difficulties, one of the ways, when, being very young, one of the ways that I, I asked my father to be involved with that is just to share examples in his life of God's faithfulness. Because I was young. I didn't have that built up. I, I have more now, and I'm getting more every day. But it is, I, I see this as my, my wife and I are involved with the young adult group at church in, in North Carolina. And I see that in their lives too, is, is they don't have this, this history, a lot of times, they don't have this history of God being faithful in difficulty and trials. And that's why it's so impar- important in the assembly, in the congregation, to share what God is doing, to glorify his faithfulness. Uh, you, we could go through so many different psalms where the psalmist says, declare the deeds of the Lord to generations yet to come. This is an important part of, of how we help each other trust in the Lord, by declaring how God has been faithful in our lives. And we share that with one another, to encourage, to exhort them to be faithful. And so I think that's a really important point to really bring this home for application is that we exhort one another to trust one another and to help us do that, we share how God has been faithful in in the past through the difficulty. All right, number four, the last point here in the Psalm, verses 12 through 18. God's people are confident in the Lord's faithfulness and they praise him for blessing. So God's people are confident in the Lord's faithfulness and they praise him for for blessing. Notice what he says, the Lord has remembered us. Now, stopping right there, just so you know, God doesn't forget. It's not like, it's not as if, you know, it's, I often tell people when in Genesis, the early portion of Genesis, when it says God remembered Noah, we're not supposed to have this idea of, oh, I forgot Noah in the middle of the flood. Oh no. You know, it's, that's not God. God's not saying that. It's a term of covenantal faithfulness. In other words, uh, we could, you could even, you know, this would be like the way that I would translate it or something like that, is God is faithfully, covenantally faithful with us. Like that's the idea of remembered us. In other words, it's not as if God forgot us and then is like, oh yeah, I do remember I had a, I had some people over there in Boise, Idaho. Where were they? Oh yeah, there they are. No. No, God has remembered his people. He, he, he is continually covenantally faithful. And that means Based on that, he will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. In other words, God is not a respecter of persons. You've heard that before, right? That's, that's biblical language. God doesn't say, sorry, you are, you are, sorry, you guys are in Idaho. I won't bless you. Or, sorry, you guys are in India. I won't bless you. Or, sorry, you guys are from Australia. Might I'm not going to bless you. Uh, you know, it's No, that's not what God does. He says, he will bless those who fear the Lord, both small and great. And as a part of that, uh, and by the way, uh, just a small note on that, just because I I have to, uh, with with regard to this, in verse 12, it says, he'll bless the house of Israel, he'll bless the house of Aaron. Now, listen, most of us don't have any Jewish descent in us. But what we learn here is not that uh, if, you, if you don't have any Jewish descent, you won't be blessed by God or anything like that. No, the point is we learn of the character of God that he is faithful to his promises. He is 100% faithful to his promises. Listen, everybody here, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you are a member and recipient of the new covenant. And guess what God promises you in the new covenant? He will never leave you or forsake you, right? He will, promises that nothing can separate us from the love of God, not height, nor death, nor, nor things present, things to come. There's nothing. How can he who has given us his son withhold us from any good thing? This is, this is a reality in Romans 8 that is very dear to us as members of that new covenant. And so the reality is that we have so many promises that we latch onto in the same sense that Psalm 115 is talking about here. He's saying on the basis of your steadfast love, on the basis of your faithfulness, this is who we trust in because of his character. And so, yes, he will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great, both the young and the old, both the foreigner and the indigenous and the native. Nobody is outside of his control. Nobody is outside of his sphere of blessing. 
Verse 14 says, may the Lord give you increase. Now we move into just a overflow of requests. Now, based on who God is, the psalmist seems to redouble his efforts to ask God for blessing based on who he knows God is. So may the Lord give you increase. You and your children, may you be blessed by the Lord who made heaven and earth. And then to conclude the psalm, he says this, the heavens are the Lord's heavens, but the earth he has given to the children of men. That doesn't mean that God relinquished control of the earth. It just means that we dwell here in the earth as his vice regents, as, as people who take care of the earth on behalf of him. That's part of what it means to be made in the image of God. So he has given us the earth, but again, his status is above all of that, superseding all of that. How foolish it would be then, as we've mentioned earlier, that any created thing could ever replace God. That would be impossible. And so in, how, how should we respond in this? In verse 17, he says, The dead do not praise the Lord, nor do any who go, go down into silence. Now, although it doesn't say this here, what I, what I think he's saying, so there's two ways you could take this verse, okay? Interpretive issue time. Two ways you could take it. On the one hand, he could be saying, praise the Lord now while you have life in your, in your, in your body because this is one of the greatest things. But that doesn't really work with verse 18, because verse 18 says, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. In other words, we'll always praise the Lord. So what I think he's doing is a common thing that the psalmists do with regard to comparing the, the righteous and the wicked. And he's saying, the, the, the outcome of the wicked is always death, is always judgment. Psalm 73 is very clear on that. I looked and I saw their end, and the Lord judged them. They were brought low. But that's not the outcome of the righteous. That's not what's going to happen for the believer. What's going to happen for the believer is we're not going to go down into silence. We're not going to be removed or robbed from the opportunity to praise the Lord. Rather, in contrast to their end, the wicked of verse 17, the righteous, we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore Praise the Lord. And you see, the psalm really ends on this high note where based on everything he's been talking about, about the character of God, about the assurity of God's blessing on the basis of God's character, even in the midst of difficulty, remember, the psalmist here is not, he's not in the, uh, you know, he's not in his castle enjoying, you know, the luxurious meals or anything like that. He's going through the ditches right now, right? And yet he says, you know what? Based on what we know about God, we are going to praise God. Because even though we're in the middle of it right now, he is there with us. He is in control. He does what he pleases. Based on his goodness, on his character, we are asking him to act, and we will have confidence that he will bring us through this. And that is what we too must exemplify with confidence, is that we bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore, just like the psalmist. So when we look at Psalm 115, you know, in times of trouble and uncertainty, in times of sickness and in health, you know, I feel like I'm giving wedding vows, you know, like all of these situations in which we find ourselves, you're always going to find yourself uh, either in trouble or about to enter trouble. We live in a fallen world. Welcome to it. That's what you're going to go through. But Psalm 115 gives us a way to process this. And we need to be reminded that our primary desire isn't simply to escape but it's that God be glorified. And can I just tell you that sometimes God is glorified through our death. But don't let that scare you because death is really just the beginning for the believer. So we have the uh, primary desire to glorify God. That is so crucial. Idolatry in any form corrupts. It kills. We must avoid that. We must confess, forsake that. And in contrast to that, as verses 9 and following say, our sole solution to this is to put our complete confidence and trust in Yahweh, knowing he's in control, he is authoritative, he is sovereign, but that he also loves us. And because of that, we can put our trust in him. So when you go through difficulty, maybe you're in difficulty right now, don't lose sight of this. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give the glory, and he will give you strength to go through that trial. Let's pray. Lord, it is good to be reminded of this reality 
You are a good God. You are kind and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Lord, you are, <laughs> you are more than we can possibly imagine. And so, Lord, I ask that you would please continue to show us the message of this psalm, that we can rely on you. And, Lord, we are weak. We sometimes want our own glory. But remove that desire from us. Remove the idols from us that we can be completely and fully confident and trusting in you. Help us to do that for your honor and glory. Amen.